It's probably been occurring in the past, but not recognized. All right. Um, so I think that the main point from this is to get it on what I call the radar screen of the, the of the healthcare workers in the valley, to let people know that a person who becomes acutely ill, this happens repetitively. This ought to be on on the sort of the differential diagnosis to help uh, determine what this patient uh, is ill from, and uh, this can be done during an acute period by a thin blood smear uh, and staining and looking with a microscope for this, the bacteria in that blood, and which was done here at the local hospital. hospital. To find the ticks, um, uh, you actually use dry ice. Is that right? Yes. Uh, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> so this is a pretty cool way to tr try to find these ticks. Uh, ticks. These ticks will find their hosts at night by sensing the carbon dioxide that's being... When we exhale. Exhale. Yeah. Right. They don't have eyes. They can't see, but they can sense carbon dioxide, and they can use parallax sensing with uh, their palps and legs to orient up a carbon dioxide gradient to help them find a host, which means blood. Mm -hmm. right? So we can actually uh, attract these ticks by putting a block of dry ice out, which then during its sublimation will release the carbon dioxide gas in all directions and create a gradient as it flows away from the, it gets a um, little trail. And if there's ticks in the area and they're hungry, they'll work up that carbon dioxide gradient, and then they get close enough to the dry ice that they're cold enough and they can't move. And that's what Bob and Brandy and I did up at the woodpile uh, east of Corvallis. We set up a block of dry ice one evening, and the next morning, Bob and Brandy found three ticks under the, under the dry ice. And we brought those in and fed them, and then we collected litter and debris in the woodpile and brought them back to the lab, and we found more ticks in that material. And four of the nine ticks we got from the woodpile were actually infected. So that's a pretty high infection rate. That's uh, you know between forty, you know maybe forty five percent, whatever infection rate. So that's a high infection rate, and and so I think we were pleased that we were able to get all the evidence that demonstrated this individual was infected, unfortunately, in his own backyard. Then we subsequently covered the wood pile. I was going to say you yeah. fumigated after that. <laughs> yeah, didn't we you? fumigated yeah. the wood pile at, at the. Um, we wanted to help uh, the the patient, uh, so we um, covered it with um, tarpaulins and. Use these aerosol bombs over a kind of, have uh, act, two active ingredients, uh, insecticides. And then after we did that, then the, um, the resident went ahead and dismantled the wood pile and uh, moved it away from the house. You've also checked some other places in the valley for this type of tick. We have. And uh, when the patient got ill in 2013, our group had already started uh, field work throughout the valley to s search for evidence that these ticks might be present. And Lo and behold, we found uh, ticks at, up Hughes Creek at the south end of the valley and uh, brought the tick in, and it transmitted it was infected, and we were able to confirm the identity of the spirochete with Sandy's sequencing. Uh, we do serological testing on the blood from the animals we, we captured. Again, I say we, Bob and Brandy captured these animals right. uh, and brought the serum samples in, and, and some of these were what we call seropositive. That is, they had antibodies in their blood that demonstrated that they had been previously infected with a spirochete. And we found seropositive animals at Lake Como and Hughes Creek and, and another chipmunk up at the uh, property east of Corvallis be, uh, was seropositive. So besides the chipmunk that had the active infection, another chipmunk had antibodies showing a prior infection. The ticks like what type of animal mainly? I mean, where, where do you find them elsewhere in the world? Right. So this particular tick is found in the western U.S., Higher, only in the western U.S. High elevations, yeah, right? Yeah, and southern British Columbia. Higher elevations. Uh, in this case, uh, the patient's property was just at 4,000 feet uh, in, in yellow pine coniferous forests where there is plenty of food, pine cones and pine seeds for supporting chipmunk and the um, pine squirrel populations. So in nature, these ticks will feed on small rodents, primarily squirrels, and in uh, individuals in the squirrel family, chipmunks and squirrels. But they'll feed on other things, too. We found evidence that flying squirrels get infected, jumping mice may get infected. Deer mice don't seem to play much of a role. But uh, So these ticks feed on a variety of small mammals, and we think birds play a role as well. Uh, we think that uh, uh, at... at uh, Flathead? Flathead Lake, uh, during a second outbreak in 2004, where um, three individuals got infected in a different cabin, 
uh, there was strong evidence that uh, birds were playing a role as hosting the ticks on the in the balcony where the kids got sick. So we've had the uh, the previous incident at, at Flathead uh, at two different times. Um, is that something you go back to and check every once in a while, or what? Well, what we did do was um, do a three year project up there, and we're just trying to wrap up the results of that in, in a series of papers, which. <laughs> The work isn't done until we get the papers written, right? <laughs> and um, so in 2008, 9, and 10, uh, we had a, a, intense, a pretty intense project going on there where we did field work on the island and Yellow Bay and other parts ar- around uh, the shore of Flathead t- to study the presence and prevalence of relapsing fever spirochetes, the ticks, and what animals were supporting it. So we had a very, very active role um, in project there for three consecutive years. Yeah. Well, that sounds like something that could give you a really good foundation for further study. Yeah, no, it's yeah. fascinating. It's a fascinating disease, and and how it's maintained in nature. You know, it's um, it's been really rewarding to work on. People get really sick, you know, and that's the unfortunate part about it. And that's why we like to talk about it to get the word out that um, there is this risk, and if people get infected, we want a prompt diagnosis made and and the proper treatment because there is this is easily treatable with antibiotics. You know, but if they're not treated, they can be sick for months.